Okay, so time for something a little different. Um, okay, if I say save the world, then it's going to conjure up ideas of impending death and destruction, or maybe the plot of the next dozen Marvel movies. Um, but I'm an optimist, and I don't think we're facing impending doom, but I do think that the Earth and those of us on it uh, are facing some problems, and it'd be nice if we could have some solutions. And I also thought it would be a, a good way to work in the mandatory picture of the Earth that I thought TED Talks were supposed to have. <laughs> okay, so we have some problems, uh, like um, our dependence on fossil fuels and global warming, disease, and pollution of our air, uh, land, and sea. Um, but I did say I was an optimist, and I think we have some solutions to these problems. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about the socioeconomic uh, problems, because as you can tell from my bio, I'm not an expert on that stuff. Um, I'm going to talk about how science can help solve our problems, okay? And when I say science, uh, you might get scared, um, but um, when I talk about science and how it might solve our problems, I'm actually talking about science and how, not how it can help us understand our problems, but how we can develop technology to find solutions to our problems. So maybe we can make our cars uh, more energy efficient, or Maybe we can make our drugs more effective, or possibly we could uh, make products that are uh, more reusable or biodegradable. And that would go a long way to solving some of those problems that I mentioned. Um, and so tech, uh, technology offers us solutions. So science, technology, towards solutions. But if I say technology, then maybe solving the world's problems isn't the first thing that comes to mind. Maybe you might say, quantum.tv, cool. Uh, but then you might think a little bit longer and say, oh, wait a minute, solar panels, they're technology, right? And then you'll say, oh, pharmaceuticals, they're also technology. And if you look harder at that technology, you'll see behind the development of most new technologies is the creation of a new material. Okay, and so on a quantum dot TV, there's exactly that, quantum dots. And so a quantum dot is a cluster of metal and non-metal atoms surrounded by some other different atoms and molecules, and it makes a little tiny semiconductor. And these make the picture on the TV better. And in your solar panels, for quite some time now, they've been made of what we call silicon wafer technology. So light goes down through a protective glass layer. It hits silicon of one type. The electrons jump out of that silicon into another type of silicon and then travel to an electrode and create electricity. And in this tablet, the active ingredient is a molecule called sofosbuvir. Okay, and this is actually a new and effective um, treatment for hepatitis C. Uh, that's actually curing it in many patients. And it works by, once it's metabolized, so you ingest it, it's metabolized, it binds to an enzyme that belongs to the hepatitis C virus and stops its reproduction. So technology, yes, it's actually the combination of ideas and new materials coming together in certain ways. Like my smartphone is a combination of a lithium ion battery, uh, super ammo LED touchscreen and a high definition camera. And so that's quite a combination of uh, materials and ideas in one piece of technology. But I think that technology or new technology is driven by the creation of new materials. And so who creates new materials? Chemists create new materials, okay? And they create new materials at a staggering rate. So the American Chemical Society keeps a list of all the compounds created 
by man or found by man or used by man and or humans people um, and the list right now is about 50 million okay so it's over 50 million compounds and it took 33 years to get the first 10 million compounds on the list the most recent 10 million were added in the last nine months okay and on average then over the last year chemists have been creating two point a new compound every 2.6 seconds so that's a lot of compounds and what are these chemists how are they going to figure out whether they, these compounds are useful or not well chemists work with other chemists so the ones that make the compounds work with chemists in other fields and they also collaborate with physicists biologists engineers to turn their compounds into new technology now imagine that you had to buy all the materials or uh, chemicals required to make those compounds and then maybe you had to do some experiments under uh, tedious and uh, maybe dangerous conditions and then you had to use expensive analytical equipment to figure out if what you set out to make is what you actually made and whether it's any good for anything so that's going to be quite a bit of work but now, what if I told you that I could uh, do all those chemical reactions, make all those compounds, find out if they're any good for anything without buying any chemicals or without stirring a solution or without isolating a product? Well, if you're any of my experimentalist friends, you'd say, liar. And I'm going to ask you not to respond in the same way and just continue listening uh, and keep your skepticism at bay. And I'm going to tell you not only can I make those compounds, but I can also model the ways that we can uh, design those compounds, so model how to put those compounds together and then also test their properties and I can do it all with a computer. Okay? So now Obviously, you're thinking, well, how are you going to go about doing that? And yeah, and in order to do that, I need to know what these materials or what matter is made of. So if we go back to our sulfosbuvir and we look at what makes up sulfosbuvir, this molecule, I can tell you that it's not actually balls and sticks stuck together, these atoms, okay? If it was, then chemistry would be a heck of a lot easier, okay? We'd all get A's for sure. Uh, a more uh, representative picture would be something like this, okay? And so there's a bunch of little dots here, and those are the nuclei of our atoms, and this blue cloud here is our electrons, okay? Our negatively charged little particles flying around the molecule. And the reason I have a blue cloud there is because we can't ever know exactly where the electrons are, okay? We can only know where they're likely to be. So the blue cloud represents where I'm likely to find the electrons, and it gives me a shape of the molecule. So now, why don't I know where the electrons are? Well, it's because when you get down very small, so when things become very small, like atoms and electrons, then they start to behave very differently than everyday objects, like baseballs, or hockey pucks. Okay, so when you have small objects, they actually behave like a particle and like a wave. All right, so this is something that's definitely hard for us all to visualize. I've been working with this stuff for a, quite a while, and it's still hard for me to visualize it. All right, and it's also a really, a real big challenge for classical physics. Okay, and classical physics is the stuff of Newton. Okay, so Newton's equations or laws uh, of physics tell us what everyday objects do but they can't tell us what the very small objects do but lucky for us way back in the early 1900s some very clever gentlemen came up with some new physics to describe how the very small objects behave and they called it quantum mechanics so now we have equations that tell us what the very small things do 
and we can mathematically model our atoms, our electrons, and our molecules, and then model matter. So then, how do we go about modeling matter? Well, I won't go talk about how to model sovosphobir just yet. Maybe I'll simplify it, and we'll talk about a single hydrogen atom. Okay, so there's a nucleus, and then we have this blue cloud that represents our electron. And then I'm gonna simplify it even more, and I'm gonna say, well, I have a nucleus, it's a positively charged particle, and then I have an electron, which is a negatively charged particle. And they interact in some way, and I don't, you don't have to know who Coulomb is to tell me that opposites attract, okay? You've probably already heard that. And this is due to um, Coulomb's law, and he tells us, he told us how charged particles are gonna interact with each other. All right, so with this and quantum mechanics, we can actually uh, determine the wave function for the hydrogen atom exactly, okay? And we call it a wave function because it describes our little particles that behave like waves. And so because we've discovered it, we know it exactly, then anything you can measure experimentally, I can calculate exactly. So there's no need to do an experiment on a hydrogen atom. That's done, right? Okay. Um, but even though quantum mechanics actually describes all the physics involved in chemistry, um, we can't just go ahead and calculate the exact answer for all of chemistry. And that's because there's a complication. What happens if I add one more electron? All right, it's negatively charged, so it's attracted to the nucleus. But I also have another electron, and they have like charges, and they're gonna repel each other. Okay, so this third interaction introduces a problem. And this problem has been around a lot longer than quantum mechanics, okay? It's known as the many-body problem, okay? And so it turns out that if I have three interacting bodies, for example, the Earth, Sun, and the Moon, all right, and Newton told us that they interact due to gravity, because there's three bodies, I can never actually write down exactly what they're going to do because the third body makes it too complicated, okay? As long as they're all interacting, I can't figure it out exactly. And so this was known as soon as Newton figured out gravity or proposed the idea. Now let's go back to our two electrons and our nucleus, all right? So we have this many-body problem, and just because we can't get it exactly, we can still tackle the problem, okay, and try and find a solution. And so one common uh, way to attack this problem is by saying, well, let's imagine that we have some imaginary system or the electrons ignore each other. They don't care, they're gonna do their thing. And it turns out we can find the exact wave function when the electrons ignore each other. Okay, but that's imaginary, it's not real. So then we have to put back in, in some way, how these electrons should interact. Okay, we have to put back in their repulsion. Now there's a few ways that we can do this. And before we tackle that, we have to figure out, well, what should the electrons actually be doing? And it turns out that we do know what those electrons are, or at least how they should interact, and we just need to build it back in to our answer. So when electrons get close, it turns out that when they come close together, they need to interact in a certain way called a cusp. Okay, so we need to make sure that when these electrons get close together, there's a cusp, and then when electrons are far away from each other, we need to make sure that they move coherently. So when one goes to the left, the other one goes to the left, and when one goes to the right, the other one goes to the right. And this is called dispersion, okay? And dispersion is actually the reason why a gecko can walk upside down on a piece of glass just to show off, okay? And so these dance moves that the electrons do, we need to build them back into the wave function in order that we can model chemistry right. So how can we do it? Well, there's a couple ways. Um, one way is to take a bunch of these non-interacting pictures, these imaginary pictures that we came up with where the electrons ignored each other, 
and then blend them together mathematically. So that's an easy way to say something very complicated. All right, so we do some math, and then we come up with our best guess at what the real picture looks like. Or we can take this probability cloud that I told you about, and from the shape of this probability cloud, we're going to detect what's missing. And we get the relationship between what's missing and the probability shape of the probability cloud from some special examples that we pick. So whatever uh, method we choose, it's going to determine how accurate our answer is going to be and how long it's going to take to calculate it on my computer. But once we do that, then we can do some pretty amazing things. Okay, so we, maybe we can design new um, solar cells that are cheaper, okay, and last longer, such as organic photovoltaics. Or maybe we can design new drugs. These drug companies, according to Forbes at least, think that computational chemistry might be a good idea. Or we might design a new material that not only takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but it turns carbon dioxide into a precursor for fuel. So there's some amazing things that can be done using computational chemistry or molecular modeling. Um, but if you take a closer look at those papers I just showed you, you'll see that there is a lot of experimentation, real experiments, real mixing of chemicals that go into uh, these design processes. And so uh, while coming up with better methods and more accurate calculations will remove some of the experimentation, there always be, will be a need for some of it. And so my experimentalist friends can now breathe their sigh of relief, right? Um, <clears throat> but we're always searching for those better ways to uh, model matter or model what electrons are doing in atoms and molecules. And it all starts from the interaction of two electrons. Thanks.